Now, if you have your Bibles, uh, turn please to the third chapter of the book of Daniel. And uh, as you know from our having reviewed uh, two of the chapters already, Daniel's in Babylon. Uh, he's been elevated to a high office because of his faithfulness to the Lord and because of the great wisdom that God gave to him. And uh, in the second chapter, we had an unfolding of Gentile world history, beginning with the Babylonian Empire and going on down through the Roman Empire and to the present day when there will be an amalgamation of nations that will represent the clay and the iron and the feet and the toes of that image. That will be the last form of world government before the Lord Jesus, who was the rock cut out without hand, will fall on it and grind it into powder and the wind will come and blow it away and then uh, his uh, millennial kingdom will be established and he will be in control of the whole earth. So that's uh, something to devoutly to be wished and to look forward to. But uh, in the meantime, uh, things were going on in Babylon. And uh, this particular chapter uh, is a recognition of God's faithfulness if we will be true to Him. The three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So let's just read through it together. Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Now this probably was several years after Daniel had gone to Babylon. There are some who estimate that this may be 20 years after he has been there. And uh, Nebuchadnezzar decides that he is going to set up on the plain of Dura, which is uh, not too far out from the city of Babylon, a statue, an image, and it's of gold. Now it seems that it would be out of proportion. A cubit is the average length from the tip of a man's hand to his elbow. And uh, if it uh, was according to these dimensions, then it would have been nine feet wide and 90 feet tall. Now you might say that would be that, that would be out of proportion. So many Bible scholars feel as though it was on a pedestal. Nebuchadnezzar was going to gather all of the great leaders of his whole kingdom together on this large plain that would hold all of them. And he was going to demand that they worship that image, which was an image of him. And in order for everybody to be able to see it, it's assumed that probably it was on a pedestal up high enough so that everyone could see it. Now, we don't necessarily have to think that this was uh, solid gold. Uh, it could have been uh, overlaid with gold. That would have been a tremendous amount of gold, although it was a very wealthy kingdom. But the thing that we need to keep in mind here is that Nebuchadnezzar had come to the place where he felt that he should be worshipped as God. That the people of his kingdom should look to him as their God. And that they ought to bow down and worship him. Now it's significant that in uh, the time of the tribulation when the church is removed and uh, the Antichrist appears on the scene, there will come a time when he will say that his image should be placed in the temple that will be rebuilt in Jerusalem and that he is to be worshipped. So this is a sort of a foretaste of what's going to happen uh, a bit later on. And uh, Nebuchadnezzar is a type of that Antichrist. So Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then an herald cried aloud, 
To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. Now this uh, certainly was very forward of him and for him to take upon himself uh, to be worshipped and demand that unless he was, the people would be punished for it. There always has been, uh, I guess throughout the world, those who are egotistical enough to believe that uh, they are superhuman. I think uh, Saddam Hussein uh, of uh, Iraq has been an example of that and uh, feels as though perhaps he might be the modern day Antichrist and that he will control the Middle East. Uh, he was dealt a severe lesson at the Gulf War time, but uh, here is another effort on the part of a ruler uh, to demand that uh, he be the one that would be worshipped by his people. Uh, there always have been state religions. Uh, there are those uh, who demand that worship be along a certain line uh, and that everybody ought to conform. Uh, we uh, even have something of that, I think, in the National Council of Churches here in this country and the World Council of Churches that is worldwide where there are those who in the ecumenical movement are saying we, we ought to band together. Uh, there's strength in numbers. And instead of being fragmented as we are, let's just join together for some of the major things. Now we as Southern Baptists have always declined to be a part of either of those organizations. Because within them there are groups that uh, deny the inspiration of the scripture, uh, who deny the virgin birth of Christ, uh, who are very liberal in their thinking and their teaching. And we just as uh, Southern Baptists don't want to be a part of that. We believe that we ought to stand true to the Word of God and uh, not be so caught up in those kind of activities that we neglect the evangelizing of the world and the preaching of the gospel. So the uh, command was that when they heard the sound of these instruments they were to fall down before the image and worship uh, Nebuchadnezzar. And whoso faileth, uh, falleth not down and worships shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. There would be immediate punishment. All of them were to respond. Therefore, at that time when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and all kinds of music, all the people, the nations, and the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had made. Now that's not quite true. They didn't all do it. As you and I know, and as we're going to find out from reading on a bit further, uh, there were three faithful ones who refused to do it. Now Daniel is not mentioned in this chapter of the book of Daniel. Uh, whether he was off somewhere on state business, uh, whether he might have been ill, where he was, we don't know, but at least he was not present there, or I'm sure his name would have been included. Wherefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came and accused the Jews. They spoke and said to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, O king, has made a decree that every man that shall hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, that he should be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded you. They serve not your gods, nor worship the golden image that you have set up. So here are three uh, who were determined that they were going to be faithful to the Lord regardless of the consequence. And we need to respect them. We need to be thankful for them. I'm sure God was proud of them. Uh, in fact, he didn't ever want us to forget them because they're mentioned 13 times in this chapter. You count them as we move on through. 
It reminds me of the preacher who was going to preach on these three Hebrew children and he was a little afraid he might forget their names and so he wrote them on a little piece of paper and pinned them on the inside of his jacket. And sure enough he was preaching along and their names didn't come to him and he looked down into his jacket and said the three Hebrew children, Hart, Schaffner and Marx. <laughs> well they are Hebrew children but not the right ones. So anyhow here are Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. And uh, they are accused by the Chaldeans who were the philosophers, the wise men of Babylon of not being those who bowed down. King, there are three exceptions. There are three Jews who didn't do it. Now keep in mind how ungrateful these men were. Earlier when Nebuchadnezzar had had that terrible dream and he called them in and said, if you can't tell me what it was and what it means, I'm going to have you all put to death, have your families all put to death. It was the intervention of Daniel, as God revealed that to him, that spared their lives. And it looks as though they would be grateful because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were included in that. The four of them had prayed and God had revealed it to them. So apparently there was a great deal of jealousy a great deal of bitterness that these Hebrews had been elevated in power over them and they wanted to get back at them. Then Nebuchadnezzar in his rage and fury commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego and they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spoke and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, do not you serve my gods? nor worship the golden image which I have set up. Now if you be ready, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the image that I have made well. But if you worship not, you shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? So the king said, uh, I'm going to give you another chance. Uh, you didn't uh, do what I commanded. You're not willing to worship my gods. And so I'm going to have them sound that music once more. And if you'll fall down and worship like you're supposed to, that'll be fine and good. And you'll be forgiven. But if you still refuse, you're going to be cast into a fiery furnace. Now notice their response. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer you in this matter. They were saying, we don't need to think it over. We don't need to get together and have a conference over this. Our minds are already made up. So if it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve your gods, nor worship the image that you have set up. These men were very bold. They were very confident. Now we know why they didn't bow down to worship. Because they had been taught back in Israel, back at home, that they were not to do such a thing. They remembered the Ten Commandments. Do you remember the beginning of the Ten Commandments? Thou shalt have no other God before me. Thou shalt not make unto you any image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down yourself or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children until the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. That's what they had been taught. And they were going to be true to God. Not a false God like Nebuchadnezzar, but the true God of heaven. And so they were simply saying, if you're going to throw us in the furnace, if we don't bow down, go ahead and throw us in. Our minds are made up. 
But if you do, we know that our God will intercede for us. We're not afraid. It doesn't frighten us. We just believe God's going to take care of us. And so they refused to bow down. Verse 19, then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury. He was just infuriated. And the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spoke and commanded that they should heat the furnace seven times more than it was wont to be heated. Not only were they going to be thrown into the fiery furnace, but Nebuchadnezzar said, heat that furnace seven times hotter than it's ever been. We want it to be as hot as it can be made. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their hose, their hats, and their other garments and were cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's command was urgent, And the furnace exceeding hot, the flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That gives you some idea of how intense the heat was. When the men of his army were able to get close enough to throw them into the mouth of the furnace, the men that were doing it were themselves killed by the terrible heat that was radiating from it. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and rose up in haste and spoke and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. It was the Son of God. It was the Lord Jesus Christ. He often appeared in Old Testament times in a theophany, which simply means that uh, he made appearances, but he was disguised, sort of like he was hidden from the eyes of the two on the road to Emmaus on the day of his resurrection. Their eyes were holden and they didn't realize who it was until he chose to reveal himself to them. So here is the amazement of Nebuchadnezzar. Three men were thrown in, bound as securely as they could be, hand and foot. And when he looked into that furnace, they they were loose. They were on their feet. They were walking around. And in addition to the three of them, There was someone else there. You know, don't you gain a great deal of encouragement from that, that no matter what kind of testing comes into your life, disappointment, discouragement, setback, you're not by yourself. The Lord's right there with you. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. The Bible says of him, there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. That's the presence of the Lord Jesus. He's with you right now. He'll be with you as you leave here and go your separate ways. He'll be with you throughout the days of this coming week. He'll be with you all the time. And these three Hebrew children found that to be the case. And so certainly we can learn from their experience that you can trust God that if you're faithful to him, he's going to be faithful to you. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spoke and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth of the midst of the fire. And the princes, governors, and captains, and the king's counselors being gathered together saw these men, upon whose bodies the fire had no power, nor was an hair of their head singed, neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had come upon them. Isn't that absolutely amazing? That they could be in a fire like that. And when they came out, their bonds had been burned off, 
but their hair hadn't been singed. Uh, nothing happened to their clothing. There wasn't even the smell of smoke on them when they came out. And it wasn't done secretly. It wasn't done in a corner. It was done so openly that all of the leaders of all of the kingdom of Babylon saw it and witnessed it with their own eyes. Nebuchadnezzar was impressed. And you know that they were impressed as well. You know, that uh, terrible furnace, uh, it just seems to me that that was God's giant microwave. Uh, you know that sometimes you can put a dish in the microwave with some vegetables in it and leave it in there for the allotted time. And then sometimes you can just reach in there and take the dish out and it's not hot enough to burn your fingers or anything. The food's hot on the inside. It's cool on the outside. Uh, this was God's microwave. It may have been a blast furnace, but God was controlling the heat of it. And it could only do what God permitted it to do. Then Nebuchadnezzar spoke and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies. They might not serve nor worship any god except their own God. When I uh, read this experience, uh, somehow my mind went back to Isaiah chapter 42. And uh, I want to read uh, a verse there, a verse 2. When you pass through the water, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned Neither shall the flame kindle upon you. It's God's promise. When it talks about the great heroes of faith in the 11th chapter of Hebrews, a certain one of them are named and indicated the kind of faith that they exemplified. And then the writer says, and time would fail me to tell of Samson and Gideon and so forth. And he said that they were some of them who quenched the violence of fire. Through their faith, they were true to God. We, we sing uh, an old hymn, How Firm a Foundation. You may remember that one of those verses goes, When through fiery trials your pathway shall lie, my grace all sufficient will be your supply. The flames will not hurt you. I only design thy dross to consume and thy goal to refine. We talked a bit last Wednesday night about uh, dealing with the difficult situations of life and how we react and respond to them. And uh, surely God's way is the best way. And we just need to believe God that he's going to be with us. And believe God that he's going to deliver us. And believe God that he has some purpose in everything he does. The purpose in this must have been to demonstrate to the world that there is a God and that that God has all power and that that God blesses and uses those who are true to him. Verse 29, Nebuchadnezzar said, Therefore I make a decree that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made a dunghill, because there is no other God that can deliver like this. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar became a believer in the true God. I, I wouldn't be surprised when we get to glory and walk the streets of gold if old Nebuchadnezzar might not be there. Uh, he was cold-hearted. He was cruel. Uh, he uh, certainly was proud to want to be worshipped. But through the experiences that we have recorded here, uh, he learned that there really is a God in heaven. He could not believe otherwise. It was demonstrated to him. Now, surely, God won't have to put us in a fiery furnace to prove to us 
that he'll be with us all the time. And that he'll take care of us. And we don't have to worry about the difficult things that may come because he's going to be right there. And he's going to see us through. And his power is going to be available to us. So uh, I trust that that gives you a, a real sense of assurance as it does to me. And I think we ought to just pause and thank God for it. Our Father, we know that often you teach us by example and precept. And as we have repeated the names of these three faithful ones over and over and over, we will never forget them. And we will never forget the experience that they had in Babylon. And, and the way they stood for you, even in the face of death. And were willing to be thrown into that furnace, believing that you were going to be with them. And you were. You honored their faith. You demonstrated your power. And Father, tonight we claim that power for our lives. Greater the Holy Spirit within us than he, the devil, who is in the world. Increase our faith. And help us to be bold in standing for you. And use us, we pray, to serve you. And we'll thank you in the Savior's name. Amen. Now, before we dismiss the service, we want to join in singing a verse or two of hymn number 298. I'll live for him who died for me. And it's the invitation time. If you're here without Christ, would you let him into your life tonight by coming here to the front and saying, I, I want to commit my life to Christ. I want to be a Christian. I want to have that inner strength that only Christians can have with God's presence there. Or you may want to come and join this good church and say, I want to be a part of what God's doing at North Ottawa. And if there's any other commitment that God's impressing, will you do it as we join in singing this hymn?